Holy God, uh, as we prepare to hear the word and the scripture for today, we ask that you help us to understand it. Sometimes uh, your scriptures are not the easiest things to understand. We ask for open eyes and hearts and minds to hear whatever you have to tell us today. And so we pray a special blessing over the scriptures and the message. Uh, we ask your wisdom and providence to shine through, and we pray this in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Uh, since I'm a one-man show, I need a second to reset myself. So. Can you uh, mute the guitar for just one second? about the battery in my guitar and I told him oh it's fine I got plenty of battery and it's got a red light on it so it's gonna not be happy with me all right sorry about that the scripture um, this morning comes to us from the book of Jonah, chapter 1, verses 1 through 17. So please hear these words from the book of Jonah. The Lord's word came to Jonah, Amittai's son, saying, Get up and go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry out against it, for the evil has come to my attention. So this person, Jonah, got up to flee to Tarshish from the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship headed for Tarshish. He paid the fare and went aboard to go with them to Tarshish, away from the Lord. But the Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea, so that there was a great storm on the sea. The ship looked like it might be broken to pieces. The sailors on the ship were terrified, and each one cried out to his God. They hurled the cargo that was on the ship into the sea to make it lighter. Now Jonah had gone into the hold of the vessel to lie down and was in a deep sleep. The ship's officer came and said to him, How can you possibly be sleeping so deeply? Get up! Call on your God! Perhaps the God will give some thought to us so we won't perish. Meanwhile, the sailors said to each other, Come on, let's cast lots so we might learn who is to blame for this evil that is happening to us. So they cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. So they said to him, Tell us, since you are the cause of this evil happening to us, what do you do and where are you from? What's your country, and of what people are you? Jonah said to them, I am a Hebrew. I worship the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. Then the men were terrified, and they said to him, What have you done? The men knew that Jonah was fleeing from the Lord because they had told them. And he said to them, They said to him, What will we do about you so that the sea will become calm around us? Because the sea was continuing to rage. Jonah said to them, Pick me up and hurl me into the sea, and then the sea will become calm around you. I know it's my fault that this great storm has come upon you. The men rowed to reach dry land, but they couldn't manage it, because the sea continued to rage against them. So they called on the Lord, saying, Please, Lord, don't let us perish on account of this man's life. Don't blame us for innocent blood. You are the Lord. Whatever you want, you can do. Then they picked up Jonah, hurled him into the sea, and the sea ceased its raging. Then men worshipped the Lord with profound reverence. They offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made solemn promises. Meanwhile, the Lord provided a great fish to swallow Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of that fish for three days and for three nights. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So uh, they're going to put up on a, a picture on the screen. We're going to start with that. So this is not a picture of Jonah in the great belly of the whale, um, but I'm wondering if anybody in here recognizes uh, what this picture might be. Nobody in the first service got it, so if you do get it, kudos to you, I guess. Anybody have any idea? Yeah, it's Pinocchio. So this is an artistic uh, rendering of Pinocchio and Geppetto in the belly of the great fish. Um, so here's another more familiar version. Put up the picture. There you go. 
the 1940s Disney version of Pinocchio and Geppetto getting swallowed by a big fish. So the cartoon, the movie, comes from a, a book that was published in 1883. It's a collection of stories about this mischievous wood puppet named Pinocchio and his father, a poor wood carver named Geppetto. So one of the stories, uh, and I don't speak Italian, so I'm going to butcher this, but one of the stories is called El Terrible Pesce Cane, which literally means the terrible dogfish, or in Italian, dogfish means shark, the terrible shark. Um, and it's a story about this mile-long, five-story high fish, so big that this fish, um, it says, can easily accommodate a, a train through its mouth. So fearsome that this shark or this fish is known as Attila, the fish, uh, the, the Attila of fish and fishermen. So in Disney's Pinocchio, Geppetto is swallowed by this giant whale named Mancho. The kind of the details get changed a little bit while he's searching for Pinocchio. Pinocchio hear new, he hears of the news. He travels deep into the ocean to follow, find the whale that swallowed Geppetto. Pinocchio makes his way inside the whale, reunites with his father. They build this huge fire which causes the whale to sneeze. They're blasted ashore and left to start their lives over together. So every Monday morning I have a, a Bible study in Carson with my folks and we kind of um, study the scripture for the next week. Um, and it's, So last Monday we were reading the story of Jonah. And I have to admit to you, the, the images that came to my mind were way back from my childhood of Pinocchio and uh, being and Geppetto being swallowed by the great whale because uh, when Jonah gets swallowed by the whale. And the stories are really different, but they also share a lot of common. And throughout the years, people have kind of made these comparisons between the story of Pinocchio and the story of Jonah. And more than anything, both of these stories are, are stories about redemption. Um, just a funny aside, when I was a pastor here, Alexis gave, uh, would set out all these wonderful themes about what we're supposed to preach about, right? And then I'd get to the scripture, and I would not at all preach on what she told me to preach about. So uh, this week was supposed to be about reluctance, um, but it's actually about, what I'm going to preach about is redemption. Uh, so I hope you appreciate that. Uh, anyway, so both of these stories, Pinocchio and um, Jonah, are about redemption, um, Pinocchio proves himself to be a brave, truthful, selfless, young a wooden puppet. He travels deep into the depths of the ocean to save his father, and because of this, he earns his right to become a real boy. He experiences salvation. He experiences redemption. Now, the story of Jonah, the redemption that takes place, is a little bit more complicated, and it little, takes a little bit of parsing out to get there, and so that's what we're going to do. Um, we're going to, I'm going to go through the, kind of the major characters of the story of Jonah to try and figure out who exactly experiences redemption in this story. So first of all, we have Jonah. We're told in 2 Kings that Jonah of Amittai is a court prophet, which is re a relatively high station in life. He has proved himself to be of worth. He has proved himself worthy of speaking the word of God. And God tells him, tasks him with going to this um, city of Nineveh, to tell them, um, to give them God's message. Now, Nineveh is the capital of the Assyrian Empire. In this time period, Nineveh was actually the largest city in the world. Um, so this is not a random person going to a random town. This is a, a proven court prophet going to the largest city in the world, which happens to have a reputation as a rough and seedy place. So God tells Jonah, go to Nineveh and tell those people to repent. Turn back their godless ways and instead worship the God of the Hebrews. God seems to know some potential in jo seems to see some potential in Jonah. He knows that Jonah has the ability to speak truth, to change the Ninevites' minds and all those things. But instead, Jonah runs away from God. He literally takes a boat in the opposite direction. So Nineveh is in modern-day Iraq. Um, Jonah takes a, boards a boat and, um, to Tarshish, which they don't exactly know where it's at, but it's somewhere in the area of Italy and Greece. So he literally goes in the opposite direction that God tells him to do. In the midst of that, he experiences this great storm. He spends three days and three nights in the belly 
of a great fish, not unlike our friend Geppetto. After being spewed out, um, Jonah finally gets the message, and he turns the other way and goes to Nineveh. So we have Jonah. Who were the Ninevites, these people he was tasked to go and talk to? According to God, despite their um, kind of rough reputation and godless ways, these Ninevites were people who were worth saving. They were per- people worthy of redemption. They were per- people worth it, <laughs> is what I'm trying to say. And according to the story, once Jonah finally reached Nineveh, he actually finds that they're quite responsive to God's message. It says that before Jonah's message even reaches the king, the people have already started um, to pray, to, to do things, um, to proclaim a fast and put sackcloth on. It says the greatest of them to the least of them, um, they returned to the God of the Hebrews. The change was swift and immediate, despite Jonah's reluctance. So at least I fit the word reluctance in there. Uh, despite Jonah's reluctance, um, God's plan had swiftly worked. Now the third group that I want to talk about involved in the story are the sailors, the people on the boat that Jonah takes to Tarshish. When Jonah's fleeing from Nineveh on his way to Tarshish, a great storm uh, falls upon the ship. It says the sailors were scared. The mariners were afraid and each cried out to their different god. Because these were not Hebrew people, um, but in their moment of their greatest need, They cry out to the Hebrew God of Jonah. They repent, they fast, they cry out to God. And through their own faithfulness and um, righteousness shown towards God, um, they kind of put the reluctant prophet Jonah to shame. So in the adventures of Pinocchio, it's very clear that it's Pinocchio that experiences redemption. We have this wooden puppet who proves himself brave, truthful, and selfless, risking his life to save his father, And because of that, he earns the right to become a real boy. He experiences redemption and salvation. But what about in the story of Jonah? Who experiences redemption in that story? Is it Jonah? Is it the Ninevites? Or maybe it's the sailors in the midst of all of it. But before I answer that question, um, I want to tell you a little bit about myself and my own story Um, I know a lot of you, but maybe even some of you here don't know that part of it, or um, for those of you I don't know, I want to tell you a little bit about my story. So we're going to put on the screen the next picture. So this is what I looked like in 2012. This was with my rock band in Iowa City. Uh, This would have been right around the time I met your... Uh, wonderful pastor Alexis and I you know had long hair a beard I drank a lot of beer I you know did the the whole rock show sort of deal um, so thank God she is a uh, I don't know wonderful person to accept the person I was um, but my friends my acquaintances the people in that band Uh, Whoever it might have been, even my own family, who would have expected this guy uh, to become a pastor? So this was in 2012. I started seminary in 2016. So it wasn't um, that too far after that. And there's a second picture. The drummer and I had both cut off our hair by then, but um, same idea. So 2012 to 2016, um, a lot happened in those years. And I think for all of us, there are certain times of our lives, um, compressed moments of time, when a lot of things happen really fast, or really a lot of impactful things change us in a real way. So much so that we might come out of, on the other side, unrecognizable to those people around us, even those people that love us the most. It might be uh, some type of physical uh, makeover, like you saw in the picture, For me, it was even more so within myself, my personality, my emotional, my spiritual inner life. Um, Change happens. Change is an inevitable inevitable part of life, and um, God works good change within us. That's the type of dramatic, redemptive change that's possible through the grace of Jesus Christ. 
So one of my favorite um, Christian songs is This Little Light of Mine. You all know that song? This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. And the reason I like it so much is because it fully encapsulates, for me, fully encapsulates the Christian message into one neat little compact children's song that we all know and love. The theology of that song is beautiful and perfect. So it was an African-American gospel tune, but it actually comes from the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus says in the Gospel of Matthew, You are the light of the world, and a city built on a hill cannot be hid. No one, after lighting a lamp, puts it under the bushel basket, but on a lampstand, and gives light to all the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, so that they may see your good works and give glory to your God, uh, Father in heaven. So Jesus talks a lot about light. The Gospels talk a lot about light. Um, And we're not talking about fluorescent or incandescent light or anything of the sort. We're talking about what Scripture describes as uncreated light. Uncreated light. The light that has been present since the beginning of time. The light of Christ that we all carry within us. Jesus came to be the light of the world. Jesus came um, to us to help us uncover the light within ourselves so that we can be our best true selves, so that we can be a blessing to others and a blessing to the world. The truth is that throughout life, we accumulate a lot of junk and we accumulate a lot of gunk. And I don't mean in our own houses, but I mean within ourselves. A lot of traumatic, hurtful experiences that shape who we are and form and create mistrust, pessimism, anger, uh, whatever it might be, addiction, alcoholism I was struggling with, um, The person that you saw in the picture, quite honestly, was a person that was broken inside. I had a lot of things happen in my life that took me to that place, but I was full of pain, crying out for help. I wasn't capable of releasing that brokenness and pain. I wasn't capable of being my best self or truly letting my inner light shine. I wasn't capable of being a blessing to others or a blessing to the world. Instead, I needed help, and I needed redemption and salvation. But the truth is that tapping into our inner uncreated light can be a painful process. Um, So I follow the lectionary at my church. Last week, uh, the lectionary, we've been following along in the Gospel of Luke. In chapter 12, Jesus says, I have come, I have come to bring fire on the earth and (laughs) how I wish it was already kindled. Let me say that again. Jesus says, I have come to bring fire to the earth and how I wish it was already kindled. Another translation says, I've come to set the world on fire and how I wish it was already burning. A lot of times we take this to mean some type of weird apocalyptic sense. Um, But what I take it to mean is we have a lot of gunk and a lot of junk that needs to be burned away. And Jesus came to take those things from us. And sometimes, shedding our past habits, our past unhealthy pattern of relationships um, can be a painful process. But the good news that I came to tell you today, the good news is that Jesus comes to help us chip away at our outer shell. Jesus comes into our lives to help us access our inner uncreated light. Jesus comes to offer us redemptive transformation so that we can be our best selves, so that we can be a gift, a blessing to others, and a blessing to the world. So back to the story of Jonah and the question, who in that story experiences redemption? Was it the title character Jonah? Was it the uh, Ninevites? Or was it even maybe the sailors? In the Gospels, Jesus describes him as himself as a pop prophet, and he actually compares, Jesus compares himself to Jonah. And in those passages, he makes it very clear that the Ninevites are the ones that are experiencing salvation because they turn from their godless ways, and they experience um, the, the God of the Hebrews. So, check one, the Ninevites experience uh, salvation and redemption. The same could be said about the sailors. They're fearing for their life on this boat in, uh, in this, in this, during this great storm. And in their time of need, they model righteousness and faithfulness, and they are the ones that turn to the Hebrew God of Jonah in prayer. 
So, two, the Ninevites experience redemption and the sailors experience redemption. So lastly, we get to Jonah himself. Jonah is a man of second chances. He's thrown into the sea during this torrential storm. He's swallowed by this great fish. Somehow, like a Geppetto, he lives in the fish for three days and three nights. He prays out to God and cries out, Deliverance belongs to the Lord. The Lord spoke to the fish and it spewed Jonah out on dry land. So check three, Jonah also experiences redemption. The truth is that they all experience redemption. Every single person in that story experiences redemption. Jesus comes to tell us that we all carry the same potential. We all carry the breath of God, the uncreated light of Jesus Christ. The message of the story seems to be that there's enough grace and enough redemption to go around, no matter who the person is. No matter what argument we could come up with um, to say that this person does not deserve redemption, God has a capacity for love and forgiveness that's beyond our human comprehension. So if you read the story of Jonah from beginning to end, um, to me there's a couple of humorous parts in it. One of it is when um, they find Jonah fast asleep in the bottom of the boat, (laughs) and they wake him up and say, what the heck are you doing, dude? Um, Another one comes at the end of the story of Jonah, um, and it's one of my favorite parts of the story. So Jonah gets his second chance. He gets the message. He goes to Nineveh. He does what God asked him to do. And in fact, the Ninevites take heed of his message, and they change their ways. But Jonah is not happy with it. Jonah is mad. He is angry. Because he doesn't think that the Ninevites deserve the love and the redemptive grace of God. In almost comical fashion, God says to him, after all that I've done for you, Jonah, is it right for you to be angry towards me? And Jonah responds, Yes, angry enough to die. (laughs) Talk about melodramatic. Angry enough to die that you have provided grace and redemption to these unworthy Ninevites. So in many ways, Jonah is not the hero. Jonah is the anti-hero. We get to the end of the story and Jonah still doesn't get it. We're left begging for another chapter with another storybook ending um, where uh, Jonah experiences the love and the grace of God and accepts it for what it is. Instead, we're left with Jonah being chastised by God and saying he's angry enough to die. But I think there's a message in that unfulfilled, abrupt ending that just like Jonah, our stories are still being written. We worship a God of never-ending opportunities. We carry the potential within us to be a blessing to others and to let our light shine. But just like Jonah, our stories are not complete. It's up to us to write the next chapter. It's up to us to write the storybook ending. So the good news is that there's an unchanging core of inner uncreated light within each and every one of us, every single person in this room, something that can never be changed or taken away. Jonah had it. The Ninevites had it. The sailors had it. Even a wooden puppet named Pinocchio had it. You and I all have it as well. It's called the uncreated light of Jesus Christ that exists in each and every one of us without exception and without qualification. Friends, Jesus came to help us chip away at our outer shell, to burn away all those things that steal our life. Jesus came into our lives to help us access that inner uncreated light. Jesus came to us to offer redemption, including second, third, fourth, fifth, how many of your chances it takes. Jesus came into our lives to help us be a blessing to others and a blessing to the world. The truth is that our loved ones, our family members, our church, our community, council bluffs, and beyond, those people need us. Those people need our light. So my encouragement to you today is let's do everything that we can do through the transforming redemptive grace of God to tap into our light and to let our lights shine. Amen. So as our um, closing sermon sort of prayer, I'm going to invite us all to sing that song, This Little Light of Mine, together. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. 
This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Everywhere I go, everywhere I go, I'm going to let it shine. Everywhere I go, I'm going to let it shine. Everywhere I go, I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. All through the night, all through the night, I'm going to let it shine. All through the night, I'm going to let it shine. All through the night, I'm going to let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Amen.